All right, welcome to the MindWorks Podcast with Dre and Kev. Welcome and today, back. we actually have a special guest. We have Fabrizio, who has a PhD in philosophy. This man knows it all. He's very in, in, very highly intellectual individual. Uh, we're gonna today's topic. We're actually gonna be talking about religion, right? And I think it's a very important topic. It's a beautiful topic to talk about. We're gonna dive into uh, different types of religion, and we're gonna talk about different other other philosophers, maybe psychoanalysts, and people that have been in the field that also talked about religion as well. So, uh, Fabri, if you just want to introduce yourself to the audience, let them know what what you're here for and what you're yeah. about and what we're gonna talk about today. Well, the field is uh, particularly vast, so um, I decided to basically concentrate uh, in one uh, specific uh, philosopher mm -hmm. and in one specific book. Uh, the book uh, is uh, You Shall Be As God, mm -hmm. and the philosopher is uh, Eric Fromm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, many of you may not be familiar with Eric Fromm, so I will say that to start with a, a little bit of history about who was Eric Fromm. Yeah. Okay, so Eric Fromm is born in Frankfurt in the year 1900 mm -hmm. and uh, is born into a very religious uh, uh, Jewish family. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, two, his two grandparents were both very well established and recognized rabbis. Mm -hmm. And the family had a long tradition of uh, religious studies. Mm -hmm. Um, Eric Fromm was uh, basically involved and directed uh, toward uh, a future as a rabbi mm. since he was very little. So, so is it, just to cut you, sorry to cut you off, but is it true that like when you're born from Jewish parents, you're defaulted as a Jew? Uh, I think that the actual rule is that the mother defined mm. the religion. Wow. Okay, so oh. as a paradox, if you're born from a... a mixed religious family mm -hmm. in which the father, let's say, is a Christian mm -hmm. and the mother is Jewish, you're considered Jew. Mm -hmm. But if you're born in a family where the father is Jewish and the mother is not, you are not considered Jew wow. unless you convert. Oh, now, gotcha. I think that that's, the, that's the, actually the rule. Mm -hmm. In the family of Eric Fromm, there was a bit of a problem, which is that the father of Eric Fromm um, became a merchant and did not follow the tradition of uh, um, religious studies. Mm -hmm. And he was considered in the family also by Eric Fromm, like a half a failure. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> okay. what happened is that uh, the grandfather of Eric Fromm turned mm -hmm. out to be more of a father figure. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, he, he kind of demonstrated an attitude toward religious study since he was very little. Who, Eric Fromm? Eric Fromm, mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. point that uh, he was also uh, sent to study under very important rabbis uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, basically, he was bred to become a rabbi. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. He went to college, and he went to college to Heidelberg. Now, Heidelberg is kind of important because it's one of the most important college traditionally mm -hmm. in uh, Germany. Yeah. Hegel used to teach in Heidelberg. Hegel okay? is a, is that an existential philosopher? Uh, 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 no, Hegel is, uh, uh, is called the ideologist. I mean, uh, ideologist. You, have, you have to be very careful with definition, but yeah, Hegel, yeah, is, yeah. Uh, Hegel uh, I would say, <laughs> is, the, is the principle of modern philosophy. So it's okay. quite important. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Eric Fromm studied there sociology, mm. and uh, uh, he graduated with a PhD at the age of 22 mm. in sociology, but also started to develop a, mm, a crisis, mm -hmm. and it actually turned out to be an atheist. So mm. he was mm. bred to be a rabbi, mm. but he turned to be an atheist, mm. and uh, he developed a very um, fond interest into psychoanalysis. Mm. He married mm -hmm. a woman which was a, a little older than him, which was a psychoanalyst. She trained him to become a psychoanalyst. So eventually, Eric Fromm, by the age of 27, so in 1927, it's easy because he was born in 1900. 1927, okay? so Freud was eight, 18, late a, 1800s, and a, then a, Eric Fromm came correct. after Freud. Correct, so okay. it's a generation mm -hmm. after. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, so, uh, basically, he opened his own study of, of psychoanalysis, 
And, and this is very important, in uh, 1930, he was hired by the Institute of Social Sciences in Frankfurt. Mm. We, we know this as the Frankfurt School. Extremely important for modern philosophy. Mm. Uh, okay? He was hired as a professor of psychoanalysis. Okay, and he became one of the most important elements of this Frankfurt School. Mm -hmm. uh, very important for uh, many reasons. Maybe we will talk about it some other time. Yeah, but <laughs> Frankfurt uh, School. Okay. Yeah, but uh, just, just uh, look into the camera when you're speaking. Sorry, to sorry, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, but basically, in uh, let's say 1933, as you know, in Germany, uh, Hitler came to power. Yeah. Now, all the members of the Frankfurt School were Jewish, even if wow. majority of them was not Orthodox, like Eric Fromm used to be. Okay. Okay? But uh, basically, one of the first laws that were passed in Germany when Hitler came to power is that uh, Jewish religion people could not teach. So uh, the Frankfurt School, with this Institute of Social Sciences, was uh, dependent on the Goethe Institute in Frankfurt, but they had their own independent endowment. Mm -hmm. So they transferred the money to Switzerland, mm -hmm. they moved to Paris, mm -hmm. and eventually they ended up in 1933, mostly because of the relationship of Eric Fromm with Columbia University, mm -hmm. they ended up in New York. So the Frankfurt School moved mm -hmm. before World War II from there to from Germany to, to, to New York, to okay? The and yeah. and uh, um, why do I mention this? Because uh, from uh, mm -hmm. with the Columbia University, they work on a very important project about authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. The project uh, lasted five years, but was not completed. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, Eric Fromm used the result of this study as the base for his first book, uh, as uh, in English, as uh, a um, independent author, which is uh, Escape from Freedom. Oh yeah, Escape from Freedom. That's the okay. book that I read. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Escape so from Escape from Freedom it was a total bestseller. Yeah. It was published in 1941 and dictated the international fame of Eric Fromm. Oh. Okay. At that oh. point. His relationship with the with the uh, uh, Frankfurt School, which was in New York, and then they moved to uh, UCLA in California, okay. soured. So we're not gonna go into the detail. Was he let go or was or he left? But right. anyway, <laughs> from went on his own. Yeah. He went on his own, and after the success of the publication of uh, Escape, Escape from, from Freedom, Freedom, he became a major major social. Uh, psych psychoanalysis, mm. philosophy, uh, 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 eminence. So, so he became a psychoanalyst, but he didn't really study psychology. He wrote, he just did sociology and re and wrote a book on. He, he studied then, sociology, and then he, then he became a psychoanalyst. Okay, but and this is very important. That's why the Frankfurt School is important. Mm -hmm. uh, the Frankfurt School uh, is a philosophical school that uh, uh, developed what is called the critical theory. Okay, now you have. Are you talking about critical race theory? Critical race theory? <laughs> no. As, as a matter of fact, they don't talk about critical race, but they talk about critical philosophy. And the word mm. critical race is referring to their meaning oh. for critical. So, what is the critical theory thing? Okay, what is that? the critical theory is uh, basically uh -huh. uh, they believe that. You can, through the use of reason, mm -hmm. uh, detect those forces that act in society, forces that are uh, from uh, within and also from without, mm -hmm. forces that are of psychological nature. That's mm -hmm. why the importance of Freud. So for, for the Frankfurt School, Freud was like a, a, a column of their theory. Okay, mm -hmm. Or they can come from social institutions. That's why... Their study on authority, Nazism, 
Nazism, uh, Nazism and fascism. fascism. That was a big part of I, their uh, analysis. I, I need to, I need you to like define that for people that are listening because I feel like a lot of people get fascism very confused with like right wing. Uh, well, uh, that's, that's part of the critical theory, which uh -huh. because they say that we are giving two different names to the same phenomena. The mm -hmm. phenomena is authoritarianism or mm -hmm. dependence from authority. Because author, authority, so a fascist is somebody that pushes your that pushes you to like not be able to talk and takes away your freedom to be authoritarian, authoritative of beliefs and ideologies mm -hmm. and things like that. Well, uh, uh, basically, he force your opinion, mm -hmm. his opinion on you with violence. With violence, yeah. So that's a fascist. Okay. Is but yeah. but <laughs> when so, you talk about uh, <laughs> Stalin, to give an example. Well, what was Stalin? A fascist? No, he was a communist. No, quite frankly, the two things are exactly the same. Yeah. They're both Forcing. pushing their opinion on people with force. Because, you know, okay. I, I recently, I, you know, you know that I spoke at a, a Gays Against Groomers event. And, and these yeah. people that were outside were calling, uh, you know, me, like calling the Gays Against Groomers organization fascist. So well, it's kind of like they're just expressing their well, opinions about it, children. It, it, it's like they call, uh, I mean, how many times I heard Trump calling somebody a communist, but does he know what a communist is? Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, uh, um, the definition of communist to Stalin mm -hmm. is questionable. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if you, now, now we are opening a small a parenthesis. A parenthesis. Yeah, okay. a political parenthesis. Okay, okay. A, a small parenthesis, <laughs> but... If you go by the definition, okay, communism is uh -huh. a definition that was coined by Karl Marx, okay? Karl Marx uh, considered communism a development, further development of socialism. Mm. Okay, if you analyze critically, critically means not uh, uh, distorted by emotion mm -hmm. or, uh, or prejudice, so okay? This is the main issue of critical. Critical yeah. means using reason without Logic. being diverted by emotion sure. or mm. by uh, uh, or by uh, prejudice. Okay, well, if Stalin was running a communist country, well, when, whenever was he socialist <laughs> before he could become communist? Because quite frankly, he was not a socialist. Yeah, he was not a communist. Mm. He was uh, as uh, Eric uh, um, as um, Marcuse, which was a colleague uh -huh. of uh, of Eric from okay. in the Frankfurt Institute. Uh -huh. he used to call. Was he a, a philosopher? Philosopher. Okay. And Marcuse was specifically a philosopher. Okay, okay? Mm. and uh, he used to call the the regime in uh, in uh, in the USSR. Mm -hmm. He used to call it capitalism of state. Mm. He would never use the word socialism to define that system because he had nothing in common with socialism the way Marx described it. Mm. And forget communism. So everyone's like basically confusing all these terms in many different ways. Well, so and, what's, what's the exact and, definition and, of Marxism? And, and about this, we go back to the book of Eric Fromm. Okay. Yeah. Why do they do that? Why people have the tendency? Uh -huh. Now, uh, before we go there, let's finish what we were saying about uh, the Frankfurt School. So, mm -hmm. uh, the critical theory means that you find uh, those forces that condition okay, your decision, mm -hmm. and you expose them, mm -hmm. and then you can fight them. And in order to find these blocks, let's call them, mm -hmm. expose them, and then control them, you need to have access, and this is what makes this Frankfurt School different from mm -hmm. other philosophical schools, mm -hmm. to every social science discipline. So you mm -hmm. analyze reality not just with social political polit politic or with philosophy or with sociology mm -hmm. or psychoanalysis, history, and so on and so forth, but combining in a common effort, all this discipline, to have a panoramic view hmm. before you flank, you find the problem and you expose it. But, but don't you yeah. think there's like a lot of problems with that? Because then people are going to group up all the stuff and then like confuse it all the, the, and mess the, it up. The, then we're all together on this and then it becomes like a bigger... Um... There is a problem. The problem is that you have to 
kind to be an expert of many different fields, fields yeah. is not enough. But that's the social that sciences. You know. so that's what they did, basically. They combined the social sciences. Yeah, to and that's what, them all. And that's what it is today, actually. Like in CUNY, like the social science department is full of like philosophers, psychologists, sociologists. Um, but, but you see, their take is that you should not analyze problems just... Uh, by the one group, one category, by the so, uh, so, uh, sociological point of view, or by the which the, was a, which was a, back in the in the nineteen twenties, nineteen thirty, the main focus mm-hmm. on uh, political economy. This is where Marx was the one that basically gave a a, 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 a major uh, importance. Mm-hmm compared to the other social sciences, to political economy. So political economy was what Marx wanted to make the most Marx made it, defined. Marx made it into the most important of the social sciences. Yeah. This is how the Frankfurt School, mm-hmm. they were Marxist, but they were also critical of Marx. Mm-hmm. So as you see, they were having a, a, a no uh, loyalty to any specific thing. So what's the definition of being Marxist? Like, why, what, what is the exact definition? Uh, it's, it's a very complex thing because uh, you can be a Marxist because you believe in Marx's uh, uh, concept of value. Value? Okay. Value. value. Okay. Marx mm-hmm. came up with a theory about value. Mm-hmm. You can believe in Marx because uh, and call yourself a Marxist mm-hmm. because uh, you believe in his uh, uh, theory of, uh, of uh, um, historical materialism. Mm-hmm. Okay, or dialectical materialism, mm-hmm. and by the same token, you can be a, a, a Marxist and say, "Well, I don't believe in his concept of value, but I do believe in his concept of uh, um, socialism." Socialism is a little bit different because uh, socialism. That's interesting. Is, You're saying that because a lot of times people refer to like Democrats and social uh, socialists yeah, and then Marxists again. Like, and like, now we go back to Eric Fromm. And okay. to the beginning of this book, <laughs> okay, I want to read you a phrase yeah, sure. because it will, it will, it will uh, address the issue very, very well. Because so, I want to know, like, why everyone yeah. like confuses, like, yeah, call people is, fascists, yeah. call people Marxists. Yeah, why exactly. are we throwing all these names around? We don't well, really understand it, and I want, okay. I want people to understand. Now, now, let me read you this phrase. This is the beginning of the book. Okay. The first phrase in the book it is words or concepts, mm-hmm. so ideology. Yeah. Referring to phenomena related to physical mm-hmm. or mental experience grow, develop, or regress with the man to whom the experience relates. So, when we say mm-hmm. he's a communist, okay, mm-hmm. it's like when the a child, the six years old child, <laughs> which is the typical example that From made in the yeah. book, tells the mother, I love you. The same child, Mm -hmm. 20 years later, will say, I love you to his wife or husband, whatever. Let's not make it a gender issue, Mm -hmm. okay? But now, clearly, the two definitions of love are totally different. Mm. There is a common ground. There is Mm. a... Okay, I see what you mean. But the expression of love or the mature adult person as a depth, that the child cannot possibly have because his experiences are limited okay. to the first six years of life. Sure. So when somebody calls somebody else a fascist, mm-hmm. what is expressing is his personal mm-hmm. okay, idea, ideology, based on his own experiences that may not be the same experiences that you have. Mm -hmm. Eric Fromm, uh, Mm -hmm. to express this concept, uh, mentioned the mm, very famous uh, uh, Zen Buddhist expression of pointing the finger at the moon. When somebody calls somebody else a fascist, Mm -hmm. it's pointing the finger at the moon, but that's not the moon. That's his finger pointing at the moon. It's his perception of the moon based on his (coughs) experience. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's like his own hum- like his own construct of whatever his own construct, and he may be he may be not as accurate, mm-hmm. not as deep, yeah. not as, not as complete so, so as when your someone, experience. So when someone does that, they're basically kind of like um, like projecting. Well, yes, 
in terms you of project <laughs> you project based on your experience mm. and and in, in this fro- uh, from uh, is very very clear mm. the moment uh, uh, your experience is alienated mm. from the idea mm. you created ideology What is ideology? Ideology, ideology. The human constructed belief. But disconnected from the human experience. Disconnected from reality. So from ideology is not science. No. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, ideology can be diverting. And there is another issue. And, and uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, from starts the book uh, defining this concept. Mm-hmm. Because uh, in reading the Bible, If you want to be inspired by the Bible, well, the Bible is trying to point out, uh, following from interpretation, mm-hmm. the possibility that you may, may misinterpret mm-hmm. or that you may be influenced by a certain diverting uh, phenomena. Okay, mm-hmm. so the Bible originated many different religions. They're reading mm-hmm. all the same story, yeah. but they interpret it differently. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because they have a different experience. I see. And the moment their experience is connected to their idea, they develop a different perception. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, uh, when, uh, um, when Eric Fromm, okay, Uh, uh, talks about uh, idea and ideology. He points out, and, and, and I'm telling you, he's doing this in the first pages of this book, mm-hmm. okay? Because he considers important to define the fact that he believes in the importance of the Bible, but he also look at it from the standpoint of an atheist, mm-hmm. okay? And uh, he believes that there is a risk in reading the Bible, which is the risk to generate ideology, The moment you separate the experience of the people writing the Bible, human beings, the Bible has been written in 12 centuries, mm-hmm. okay, in which uh, the people that were reading were passing through an evolution from uh, a social, a tribal society mm-hmm. with kings to a society where they have different classes, they have a completely different take a socially take mm-hmm. okay so the view of uh, the god of abraham mm-hmm. is not the view of the god of uh, uh, um, isaiah okay the prophet mm. i mean it's the same book but it's not the same god god had an evolution okay why mm. because the people expressing the concept the idea of god evolved And because their idea is connected to their experience, mm-hmm. it's also the idea of God so, evolved to something different through the 12 centuries in which the Bible has been written. Yeah, so in 12 centuries, that's why you have like multiple types of Bibles. This, you have like the first you have, no, well, you have a well, you have an evolution. Yeah, okay? an evolution of Bibles. So, yeah. the, so the, the, each the one Bible, branches off in certain ideologies. And yeah, the, well, the Bible is the Old Testament. Then yeah. you have the New Testament. But the sacred text in the Jewish religion are also other. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, they have uh, 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 to give an idea. They have uh, the. Um, interpretation of Maimonides, which is uh, mm-hmm. considered the most important uh, uh, philosoph in the 12th century, the Middle Ages, mm-hmm. okay? Or they have their book of, uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, re- of rules, mm-hmm. of social rules, okay? Uh, to give you an example, uh, to make it very simple, yeah. it's called the Talmud, okay? The Now, Talmud? Talmud. Talmud is, is another sacred uh, book, uh-huh. which is a development, a spring off of the Bible. Okay. okay? Now, when uh, when we hear the uh, the fact that the Jewish don't eat uh, pork meat, mm-hmm. okay, the pork meat is forbidden. Well, this is a rule that we don't see in the Bible. It's not one of the ten. It's te- not, not oh, one of the ten. ten it's not one of the ten commandments. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. what does it mean that after the ten commandments, mm-hmm. after the Bible, the Jewish uh, 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 society, mm-hmm. okay, developed other norms, other rules they live by, which are developed, extrapolated by the Bible and the Ten Commandments. There are some of them are 
a development of the concept, mm. but they're different. Okay, uh, when you study uh, the pre-Socratic philosopher, pre pre Socratic, so philosopher that, uh, that, that uh, uh, Greeks yeah. that were okay. before Socrates. Okay, mm -hmm. well, one of the most important school was the Pythagoric. Okay, Pythagoric. <laughs> okay, the Pythagoric had a set of rules. And then they had what they call akusmata rule, which were rules that were more uh, 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 stringent uh, mm -hmm. and concerning other mm -hmm. element of their school of philosophy, uh, like uh, don't eat fava beans because mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. may reincarnate into the fava beans. Okay, mm -hmm. that was not part of the basic rule of uh, Pythagorean, but was part of the akusmata. So, okay. so, so in a sort of Talmud of the Pythagoric. So just to like cl clarify everything, basically the Bible uh, goes through different like phases or like changes depending well, on the ideology of the time. That's the reading of Eric and it, Fromm. And, it, it's ba and that's what Eric Fromm basically <coughs> portrays, that the Bible has changed multiple times throughout history, this is throughout the 12 how, centuries. This is how Eric Fromm explained one of the biggest contradictions in the, in the Bible. Mm-hmm which at the beginning portrays a God, which is quite frankly, a psychotic, <laughs> neurotic, violent, jealous. Mm -hmm. And then we see a God that is, not, that is like a, in, a, in a, a partnership mm. with men, that make a mm. covenant to men. What happened? I mean, mm. uh, philosophically, from the logical point of view, if there is a perfect being, he cannot evolve. Because if he evolves, it means that at a certain point he was not perfect. Mm, okay. okay. That's the philosophical take. It's one of the biggest questions sure, about religion. this. And the ancient, the pre-Socratic, to go back, mm -hmm. uh, had a very interesting take about it because they noticed this contradiction because they also had their religions and their gods. Mm, okay. okay. And one of the arguments against the gods was... Hey, but wait a second. You're telling me that this person is perfect. Hey, but, but if he evolves, if he changes, he cannot be perfect. Yeah, that's interesting. It kind of goes against, like, I guess, like, you know, you ever heard, like, Methodist Church? The Methodist yes. Church? Methodist, they're, like, yeah. very, like, uh, sect, yeah. they're very progressive within their religious beliefs, correct? Like yeah, they, they change things around a lot. Yeah, they change things around <laughs> yeah. a lot. Like, even they're even the type of church that hangs, like, progressive pride flags on their church. Yeah, on the, on yeah, the I've seen and stuff like that. Churches, yeah. And, um, you know, like, I, I just want to know, like, I wanted to ask you, like, what is your take on the Methodist church? If you Do you know a lot about the Methodist church? No, I don't church? know much about the Methodist, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I, I can tell you that uh, 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 what Fromm says is based on the fact that your experience Mm -hmm. determine your take on your ideas, on your concept. Mm -hmm. The two are connected. They have a dialectical relationship. And uh, mm. based on the fact that uh, uh, social environment, parental uh, um, sure. education mm -hmm. may affect, may change, okay, mm. also your experience and the way you relate to your idea changes. Mm -hmm. And this is how he says uh, you can explain like a psychotic God mm -hmm. became like a partner mm -hmm. God and made a covenant. Or like the Christian reading of the Bible mm -hmm. turned into a God of uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. This is not the God of Abraham. Okay, so this guy seems like he critiques gods and its stages of God. But what's his thesis? Like, what's his idea of God? Okay, now, his thesis is that God is a projection of our inner aspiration. Mm -hmm. Is a projection of what we would want to be or the potential that we have. That's why he titles the book, You Shall Be as God. Okay, so he's so you, atheist. We, he's still he, atheist. He's an atheist. Day. He's an okay. atheist. He believes in humanism. Okay. So mm. what he, what we are he, the gods. He's saying we have the potential to become yeah. our gods, our own gods, for our ourselves. Our own gods. The moment we develop our good behavior yeah. and control our bad behavior, because these are mm. the theme of other books. Mm -hmm. But in other books, mm. Eric Fromm expresses the idea that uh, we basically have uh, different uh, drives, mm -hmm. okay? And it's up to us uh, to somehow direct, uh, direct these drives mm -hmm.
toward life, mm -hmm. construction, development, growth, mm -hmm. or toward death, which is that was my distraction. Next uh, which is Freud. Okay, this okay. is where. Uh, uh, what do you uh, say about death? What's his thesis or uh, concept of death? He is a, a Freudian. Uh, so he believes, and, and it's very interesting, even if we go away off the book, it's very interesting because uh, he is Freudian, but in a very different way mm -hmm. from Freud, to the point that his current of psychoanalytical theory is called New Freudianism. Okay, okay? and you can uh, um, mm -hmm. pretty much put in that category other uh, uh, psy psychoanalysts like uh, Adler or like uh, uh, her Horney. Mm -hmm. Karen Horner, Horner, Karen Horner, okay, Horner. and he collaborated. Actually, they were lovers for a certain time, but he <laughs> cooperated with with uh, with uh, Horney. But now, what is his take? Well, he takes the mature uh, theory of Freud, which is the theory of Freud after 1920, where he changes the theory from uh, uh, the driving the drives. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk instinct. Okay, Instinct. the word is drive. Drives. Okay, the drive, in conscious drive of libido and ego, that was the original. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Freud theory. Psychosocial stages. Yeah. Psychosexual yeah. stages. Yeah. yeah. He, he develops it into something different, uh, uh, coined the two terms of uh, uh, um, eros and thanatos. Oh, th or, thanatos and eros. Yeah. Okay. Eros and or, thanatos. Life instinct and drive, death. life drive, and, and death, drive. death drive. Now, uh, Thanatos those would be destruction drive too. Destruction, right? destruction drive. So, drive. what uh, Freud mm -hmm. is basically saying, we have some unconscious drive mm -hmm. that pushes mm -hmm. in two different directions. Then we have uh, also uh, without drive, which is the social superego, you mm -hmm. know, which act as an outside force that tries to control us. But uh, these two drives are conflicting, are completely different. Hmm. Okay? Unfortunately, Freud uh, does not explain exactly. He was confused himself, uh, not so sure about how these forces act, operate. And that gave uh, uh, birth to many different theories. Now, the from takes this construction, mm -hmm. but uh, completely desexualize the drives. In Freud, those drives have a very strong sexual connotation. Mm -hmm. In from, he, uh, uh, how can I say, expands the field and considers sexual sex uh, one of the many elements in which the drives are basically operating. Mm. So his theory of psychoanalysis is very different. Mm. And by the way, apparently this is the reason there was a break with the Frankfurt School, because the Frankfurt School were Orthodox Freudian. Mm -hmm. Orthodox Freudian? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, well, like Lacan, okay, I don't know. <clears throat> Lacan is not very popular in America, but... Mm -hmm. Lacan is a very... Oh, Lacan. Lacan. Yeah, Lacan. Lacan, Lacan, yeah, yeah. Lacan. Uh, is a very, a very yeah, yeah. orthodox Freudian. So everything has a sexual charge, not in from. Mm -hmm. So uh, that makes it a completely oh, okay. different, uh, you know? So when you say orthodox Freudian, you mean like the old testaments of Freudian uh, philosophy and uh, theories? Quite, like quite frankly, uh, quite and, frankly the, the, yeah. the Freudian psychoanalytic field never really took uh, the change uh, of 1920. Uh -huh. And Eros and Thanatos never really figured mm -hmm. in yeah. their way of psychoanalysis. What uh, does uh, Eric Fromm think the Bible mm -hmm. is about? Yeah, and, uh, what, talk about it. And what what, are, what's, yeah. what's, his, what's Eric Fromm's viewpoints on the Bible? Well, uh, let's say that uh, his opinion mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, the Bible is a document a revolutionary book, and his theme is the liberation of man mm -hmm. from many different factors that basically enslave him. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned, uh, well, 
a couple of them we can go through. They're complicated. I think uh, we can maybe talk about it some other time. And, and also just but, like from in general, he read like all these like religious scriptures and Bibles. Like he read all these things and like well, he studied them. He, he studied, studied them, them and yeah. kind of just wrote, wrote a whole thesis yeah. about it. And basically this is what he comes out with his ideas about the Bible and what he believes. Yeah. And we, just remember like, you know, as mentioned, you know, before it's mentioned, it's just to note that Eric Fromm, although he was an atheist, he was also very humanistic and had respect for people's religions and their beliefs. This is kind of like an individual that steps out of the religious ideologies and beliefs and kind of looks at it from the perspective of that sort of atheist. Yeah, yeah. A- atheist doesn't mean that that is a, a alter ego mm-hmm. of a humanist. I mean. Yeah. You can believe in God or not believe in God. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, as long as we are on this planet Earth, mm-hmm. we should uh, believe on each other. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. and uh, this is basically the take of yeah. Eric Fromm. So when he talks about this, you know, just uh, I guess it's just important for the viewers to just understand that you know this is his take on it from his perspective. And so because we're about to talk about what was it, sla- like slavery? Yeah, well, and what? He, he thinks that it's a revolutionary book, mm-hmm. and his theme is the liberation of men from incestuous ties, and it's complicated, we may go about this some other time, yeah. blood and soil, but very important, mm-hmm. the submission to idols or idolatry. Mm, okay? Idolatry, what is idolatry? Idolatry, well, um, actually, uh, from uses the, uh, the, the adjective, Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, very often to um, uh, simplify for people that have a problem with the word uh, alienation, mm-hmm. to simplify the understanding of the word alienation. Now, alienation is a word that was coined by Hegel, mm-hmm. and that Marx uh, somehow uh, turned into uh, something similar but different. Mm-hmm. But Eric Fromm explains alienation. And uh, to do that, uh, it refers to the book of Exodus from the Bible. So mm-hmm. a, a very good example of how Eric Fromm uses the Bible as a source of inspiration. Mm-hmm. So in the ba- Bible, in Exodus, there is a famous uh, episode of the golden calf. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you recall it, but we can go The golden calf? The golden calf. 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 Mm-hmm. The, uh, Animal calf. Yeah. yeah. A cow, a golden cow. Let's call it a golden cow. (laughs) Okay, so uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, the tribe of Israel uh, was free from the Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. They were not slaves anymore, but they didn't have yet a a place for themselves. So they were Mm -hmm. running around the desert, okay, Mm -hmm. searching for a a, a land for their own. Land for their own, yeah. And uh, at a certain point, uh, Moses... Mm. left the tribe and uh, went to the, the peak of Mount, Ar- Mount Ararat because uh, he had to receive from God the rules. Yeah. So that the group of the Hebrews that were escaped from Egypt mm-hmm. would have norm that would uh, 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 establish them to, to, to survive as a, a society. Yeah. Okay. So these are the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Now, when uh, uh, Moses, while Moses is uh, receiving the, 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 the rules, the, the Ten Commandments, the tribe of Israel felt uh, a vacuum. Mm-hmm. They felt like they didn't have their leader. Moses was not there. He was up uh, Mount Ararat. And yes, there was uh, Aaron, which was the brother of Moses, which was in charge of, let's say, keeping the order. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, uh, people felt like they were missing, okay, the person, the leader that would uh, manage them. So they started to develop a fear, fear of uh, what's going to happen to us. Mm-hmm. Will we ever reach the promised land? Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. what will happen to our children? Will they survive? Well, where do we get food? How do we feed ourselves? With the lack of a leader. Okay, the, the leader, the fact that the leader was, wasn't there mm-hmm. created a vacuum that Aaron, the brother of Moses himself, could not fill. Mm-hmm. So what did they do in order to compensate this fear and uncertainty that they were feeling? Mm-hmm. Well, they collected all their jewelry and they melted down all of this 
into a golden idol, mm. which is the shape of a cow. Mm. And they started to submit and pray to the golden calf, calf. Mm-hmm. okay, in order to uh, 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 avoid and uh, suppress or control these fears, fear mm. of the future. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so the first and most important uh, 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 element of the covenant with God, mm-hmm. which was you shall have no other God. Okay, it was yeah. basically broken. Right. Because uh, while God was saying, the message was other God don't exist. They're a figment of your imagination. Okay, mm-hmm. I am the one and you should follow And who said me. that? God in the first pages yeah. of the Bible. Genesis. Genesis. Okay, in Genesis. Yeah, in Genesis. Okay, mm-hmm. and eventually, okay, uh, 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 the, in the, in the in Noah uh, um, book of Genesis, story of Genesis, mm-hmm. God made a covenant mm-hmm. with the tribe of Israel. Okay, mm-hmm. so he became from an absolute uh, monarch into mm-hmm. a constitutional So you see the evolution of God, okay? (laughs) Now, he made a covenant, okay? But these people broke their side of the agreement Mm. and started to worship a different God, which they made themselves. They created a God themselves. Mm -hmm. So what does Fromm say about this process? They said that they Mm. alienate, they created an outside uh, element mm. the force mm-hmm. they alienated they trans they transfer projector their strength mm. their fears their uncertainty to this object of their own creation mm. and in doing so they alienated themselves from their powers of human being the power of making decision and mm. they projected that to this object That at the end was their own creation. So basically, this is idolatry. So, so <laughs> idolatry is basically the creation Please. of something that you sort of idolize based on your perceptions and what you believe. And the problem with that is that it's based, like it's coming from you, not the objective reality. More than what you believe is based on your fears, most than what you believe. Yeah. So, your fear, <laughs> oh, so you're idolizing based off fear, probably internally within yourself. So that's actually like a really interesting thing. And this, and this is probably a reason why a lot of people go towards... Listen, you're the psychologist. You understand very well what happens in this process, okay? Yeah. There is a, an outside source to which you project. Mm. And in doing so, you lost control. Going off the topic of ideology, right? Like, it's important to also mention that, I guess like in terms of the Bible, uh, Eric Fromm is mentioning it as a, as a thing of... You know, um, well, he, he, yeah. he starts in the book uh, mm-hmm. at the very beginning, yeah. uh, expressing, as we said, uh, how it's important not to separate an idea mm-hmm. or a concept from the experience that somehow relates to it. Okay, but at, at that point, uh, mm-hmm. it kind of explains how this concept uh, separated, as he uses the word alienated. Mm-hmm from uh, the, the, the experience mm-hmm. that uh, is related to it, somehow turn into ideology. Mm-hmm. And then our ideology becomes a, is considered a negative aspect. And why ideology kind of uh, becomes an almost uh, automatic development of this alienation, separation. Yeah, because you, you, uh, you mentioned it had to do yeah. with fear. Exactly. Like people fear not having the, the God there to lead them. Therefore, that fear led them to this idea of idolizing some individual. Well, and I'm kind of concerned because then when you apply that from the past, from the Bible, and then you apply it to the real world today, you see that happening a lot within culture and media. And like, you know, these, these media companies put out these characters that kind of like are idolized by younger people. And it's kind of like you question yourself, like, what is it better for young people? children and young adults to really idolize are these people like sexy red 
or you know um Nicki minaj or right. ice spice and all these female artists and even like the andrew tates and things like that and the trumps mm. I, like what's what's like more appropriate to idolize do well, we go back and idolize like something like the bible about morals and, and things well, like that reason, and god the reason uh, from uh, spends a lot of words in uh, explaining this pro- process which is quite complicated mm-hmm. okay is because uh, uh, the ta- the sacred text mm-hmm. carry the risk of being diverted from their principal message which is into which is uh, freedom from uh, slavery mm-hmm. but freedom from slavery also of uh, 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 idols mm-hmm. also of demagogues from uh, the the wealthy men that force you to work for for poor wages this is a form of slavery the bible at the end is a a, a text that try to promote freedom mm-hmm. of the human being okay also from the false gods what are the false gods uh, and how question. do they develop mm-hmm. why uh, 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 the bible is very keen about uh, establishing the fact that God has no name, okay? Because it cannot be related to a fi- finite, definite things, mm-hmm. okay? God cannot be a, 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 an object, yeah. okay? A, anything that is definite, that has its own uh, a, a shape and color, okay, cannot turn into, uh, be confused with God. Um, there is an episode that also also Jordan Peterson yeah Jordan talks Peterson a, talk, talks about it okay mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, he's in uh, in a, he made a series of 36 hours about Exodus <laughs> okay but in Exodus <laughs> Exodus at a certain point at the very beginning um, God appears to to Moses and mm-hmm. basically intimates to him you have to go to the people and free the Jewish from the joke of the Egyptians. Yeah. Okay. They are enslaved. I want the people of Israel to be free. And you are the one that I give uh, the, uh, the, 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 the task, power. the, the task, task to, to free uh, the people of Israel. Okay. And uh, of course, Moses uh, was there married with his, with his child yet found peace within himself, with his family, and he said, well, why me? I mean, who am I? Yeah. I mean, and there is this dialogue in Exodus between uh, God and Moses, where God basically is convincing Moses that he has to do it, okay? And, uh, and uh, eventually, Moses said, okay, but what do I do? I go there and I tell her that you, you told me that uh, I am in charge or make you free, okay? Take you away from the from the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Uh, who do I who do I tell him you are to tell to tell? What do I tell him? Who mm-hmm. are you that you know? Yeah. How can I go there and say, well, X told me to take you away and to make you free again? They will tell him hey, who is X. Yeah. Right? Okay. So there is all this discussion mm-hmm. in which uh, God concedes to he, to to Moses that because mm-hmm. of the way. The people of Israel, the the Jews, have uh, have developed under the slavery under the Egyptian. Mm-hmm. Well, he has to concede mm-hmm. that he has to somehow give him, even if he's the nameless God. He doesn't have a name because it cannot be something definite. Okay, he still has to give uh, Moses something that the people of Israel would believe as uh, an endorsement. Did he say God? Like, call me God? <laughs> when God told him, tell him that I am the one with no name. Mm. Okay? Mm. And, and and Moses said, well, but you know, when I tell you the one with no name, what are they going to tell you? That I'm crazy. Yeah. You know? Okay? So, so, uh, so was, was why, this, was why this, the one with no name? Was this basically because God was trying to, like, not... Form into the idea of ideology be- because like you didn't want to be no, idolized. It's a very, it's a very simple concept. The moment that you give a name mm-hmm. to something, let's say a book, mm-hmm. you have s- the representation of a finite object. He right. has a, a place in space and time, mm-hmm. and it cannot be something else. Yeah. Okay. 
So God calls himself the nameless because he cannot be related to something fi- finite because he is not. Okay, because he is everything and nothing at the same time. Mm. He cannot be an object. Why? Because the Bible try to uh, uh, express the concept that uh, rely on false god and object okay is a form of slavery the moment you believe into the false prophet well you will lose your freedom and you will be enslaved to the false prophet and what tells you that the pr- false prophet is not following his own interest mm-hmm. and is trying to Uh, 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 basically uh, uh, maneuver to, to, to exploit you mm-hmm. in order to accomplish his own and to put in practice his own secret agenda. So I, I, uh, you, yeah, the history of Israel yeah. has plenty of examples of false prophets. Okay? People that, uh, this is based on, the, on something that is... Uh, uh, um, That is quite important. I mean, we're not going to get into that, but it's the messianic message, okay? The fact that a, a messiah would eventually manifest and will lead all the human spe- species to freedom. Mm-hmm. It's not limited to the Jewish religion. Yeah. In the book, it says it's basically the all human species, okay? Now, Many false messiah appeared. Their interest was uh, simply to gain the power on the shoulder of the support of the people mm. in order to control the political uh, agenda and to get the privilege of, uh, a, and, and the benefit. But I, I just want to go back to the idea of like God not saying I'm the nameless the person with no name. Like, I, I feel like that's kind of like an inference to the idea of like not wanting to be idolized. Like, I just want to be God, you know? Like, I don't, I don't want that idolization. I, I want to just, like, you, you just tell them that this is the force of nature that is making this happen. Well, uh, and there, there, uh, there is uh, an interesting, interesting, uh, interesting element that, uh, from, I will read it to you, because one of the notes I took uh, yeah. about the fact that uh, um, in the uh, Hebrew language, yeah. Yeah. okay, uh, the word for the nameless, uh, okay, is heye, if I pronounce it right. Okay, Hiya. so so <laughs> God says, uh, my name is Haye. Okay, uh, yeah. Haye is the first person of the imperfect. Okay, now in Hebrew, you don't have a present tense. You have perfect or imperfect tense. I- Hebrew, when they, uh, let's say, they want to use a perfect sense, a, 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 a present sense, yeah. okay, they don't say, I write. They say, I am writing. So that i- implies the fact that the writing has been completed. Hmm. Okay? So uh, when uh, God says in, uh, in the Hebrew, in the first person of the imperfect, okay, a sort of I was, uh-huh. okay, what does he say? That because so- it's not completed, not perfect, okay, and that is the element that defines him, he cannot be a completed process. When uh, uh, Eric Fromm talks about Genesis, mm-hmm. okay, there is a very interesting passage that also uh, Jordan Peterson uh, analyzed, uh, even though he misses something quite important. Okay, mm-hmm. Now, I, I'll, uh, I'll read it from the book. But before you do that, I just want to say, yeah. with, the, with the Jewish thing, with the Hebrew language saying, like, uh, I am writing instead of I write, like, So they don't have, their language is not geared towards the present moment? Like, Correct. I, I write? Correct, because the present defines just, something that is... I am writing, or I wrote? Because if the present is not completed, is the past. So it doesn't that's, exist. That's, that's extremely interesting, because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring it to, like, the psychological knowledge of, like, sensation and perception a little bit here. Because in sensation, it does take a little bit of time for something that we perceive or sense to mm-hmm. reach our conscious mind. So it's interesting that in the Hebrew language, they kind of see it that way in terms of like, you know, I already did something. I can't really be in the present because my brain is not typically like in the present. If it, like it, we, it, all, we all kind of live in the past yeah. a little bit consciously. We kind of live in the past a little bit consciously. So I'm wondering, like, did they you know about that? live in the past when the thing is not completed. 
Yeah, when like, it's completed, you're in the future. But it so takes it's not the present. It takes our senses a little bit to like pick up information. It takes like a millisecond of like our brain to calculate it to make it conscious to our awareness. So like I'm wondering if like the Hebrew language or like the Jewish people knew about that type of. But that was their way of uh, communicating. That's really so interesting. So in their in their yeah. way of communicating, that's a, now mm-hmm. when we go to this is the past. It's the beginning of uh, of um, of Genesis. Okay. Uh-huh. And, and it says, God saw the light, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the creation, okay? After creating the light, God says, God saw the light and was good, okay? When, uh, uh, after creating the land and the sea, God saw that it was good. After creating the vegetation, God saw that it was good, okay? So, what, what did he see? What he's saying is that he created something and it was completed, it was done. It didn't need a development. Mm-hmm. It was done. It was it was, uh, was working within the parameter of nature, and he had his function, and it serves served his purpose. Mm-hmm. When God created man, he didn't say it was good. Mm. He said that the whole creation was good, mm. but not man when itself. he created man. Why? Because man clearly was not completed. Mm. Man needed development. Hmm. Okay, so this is a very important passage, and the, the ascetic uh, uh, tradition of Jew mm-hmm. you know, interpreted this fact, okay, because he says man was created as an open system, okay, hmm. that had to grow and to develop something that was not true about the other element of creation, not about light, not about plants, not about fish, okay, so. He's create a bit of a of a of a friction because if <laughs> if God was if man was created so we're not good. was created but if man was created to God image and God was perfect, <clears throat> how come the man was created as something that has to be perfected? But that's because then, then it goes into the development of like <laughs> sins and like you know like you you have these sins that you know like are going to be imposed or whatever the case is. Well, you the do common, this. Concept of sin, we enter into another field. We go into Dante's Inferno very, here very, a little bit. Very, very, <laughs> yeah, very complex, you know, with the concept of sin. But le, le, let's put it this way. Uh, uh-huh. The fact that man uh, uh, is a working process, mm-hmm. okay, is what uh, Eric Fromm interprets as the fact that he could have the possibility already when he was created not to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And to go back to your brother Daniel, he (laughs) lives, okay? He was determined (laughs) that he would have rebelled against God, that he would free himself, that he was kicked out of heaven in order to follow a different path, Mm. okay? Because he was not created, finished, and perfect. So it was determined for men to like screw up and go into a different direction. It was. It was. There is. A, there is an element of determinism mm-hmm. in that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was determined, and God created man with this. Let's call it imperfection mm-hmm. that had written in it that he would have rebelled, and the rebellion of man, at, at the fact that he was kicked out of of heaven, created a conflict. A, how can I say, um, competition between God and man. Mm-hmm. God uh, kicked man out of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of heaven before he would eat also from the tree of life because at that point, man would have had the knowledge because he ate from the tree of knowledge what? and eternity Was that because really? he would have eaten from the tree of life. And at that point, it would be like God. So was it written before Genesis, those, those remarks? This is in Genesis. That's in Genesis. This so. is Genesis. That's, that's before Adam and this Eve. Is, this is... <laughs> Adam and Eve would be at the end of the creation. Man, yeah. I mean, Adam and Eve. Now, so there, are, said there are two good, versions... Uh, good, and then there are two versions Jordan Peterson mm-hmm. uh, uh, said about this. One in which first Adam was created and then Eve. And one in which Adam and Eve were created at the same time. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. No, <laughs> Adam and Eve. Okay? So, but, but the issue 
was that <laughs> because they ate from the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge, mm. God feared <laughs> for the competition, and before they could eat from the tree of life and become immortal, yeah. he kicked them out of heaven, mm. and this way... He so, determined his supremacy. So just to clarify, like God basically made men imperf imperfect because of what reason? What was the reason for that? What do you, what, what's the purpose of that? Okay, now here you have different theories. And you know, this is what is interesting about the Bible, okay? That mm. uh, in, 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 uh, in your interpretation, okay, the interpretation that the ascetic current mm -hmm. within the Jewish religion gives is that it was done on purpose Okay. To give him the opportunity mm -hmm. to rebel, to become independent, mm -hmm. to generate history. History is born the day that Adam and Eve are kicked out of heaven. Yeah. Okay. But and in the in the reading of Eric Fromm, uh -huh. they if they develop the real true potential of uh, of uh, of uh, the, the the good aspect of humanism. They have the possibility to become like God, like mm -hmm. God and mm -hmm. go back to the Garden of Heaven. So that's our so goal. That's the goal then, basically. <laughs> that's, well, that's an interesting. That's <laughs> so, you know, I know. Uh, so basically, <laughs> it's great to know all this. I think the, you know, we have to um, end it here for today. But like, you know, it's interesting. Just, we'll cut it off here, but we'll definitely make like a part two about this and continue from here and moving forward and learning more about the religious concepts and, and, and Eric Fromm's viewpoint and stuff like that. But very interesting stuff. Um, so... You know, you guys, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for listening. We're going to leave it off here for today. And thanks a lot. We're definitely going to have probably a part two on this whole topic. For okay. Sure. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Peace.